Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. A part of the U.S. Army. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. What other kind of... Uh, who jumped more to uh, do that? Uh, so not in either. Somalia. See? Somalia? No, no. Liberia. South Africa? Liberia. Liberia. Oh, Liberia. 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 You met the other day, didn't you? Yes. yes okay. And now the end. Where are you from? Laos. 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 Is from Cambodia. Cambodia? Myanmar. 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 Indonesia. Indonesia. Ghana. Ghana. Who's from Ghana? Ghana. Ghana. Two Ghana. One. One Ghana. Okay. Yeah, traditional TV. No, it's not possible for now. Should say to Jomoran. You Yoma. Mayor Jomoran. Jomoran. Okay.
So this is my topic. And actually, in talking talk about the past, what I'm going to talk about a lot of it is more maybe oriented towards the Chinese students here than towards the non-Chinese students. This involves the history of, of relations between the U.S. and China before 1949. But let me talk about that a little bit because it's interesting. The, the, for a very long time, Americans had a, an interest in China. Actually, the first American ship that left the United States after American independence was a ship going to China. It was actually going, going to trade with, with, uh, you know, with China and bring back things to the U.S. And for, in those days, the law, again, for a very, very long time, there have been two big sources, or were, two big sources of interest that American people, Americans had in China. And both were related to the fact that there are so many people in China. Zhou Wen Tai Um And the first is trade, and the second is religion, Christianity. And in both cases, the interest was related to the fact there were so many Chinese. So very little, when these traders went to China, they had this idea, or, or business people, there were so many people in China, if I could sell only one of my product to China, let's say I made candles, and I could sell only one candle to everyone in China, I would become rich. So the size of China made trade with China very, very attractive. The second reason also involved how many people were trying to use Christianity and religion. He said, many Americans thought that if Westerners could, make, could convert Chinese people to Christianity, it would be the biggest victory for Christianity in thousands of years because there are so many Chinese. So the two types of people who tended to go to China early in our history, our American history, were interested either in trading with China or in trying to persuade Chinese people to become Christian. And it's interesting, the very first um, museum in the United States, the oldest museum in the United States, it's actually north of Boston, not far from where I live, is a museum of Chinese art. And it was set up by Americans who had gone to China to trade and had brought back artwork that they bought in China and use it to set up this museum. This is the very, very first American museum. It's a museum to, uh, uh, can you, uh, uh, you can't try, right? Oh, okay. You can't try. He learned uh, Chinese language by uh, himself wow. for six months. Wow. Oh, okay. Beach up by the end. Anyway, so, uh, and it's interesting, during the period of really what Chinese call the Hundred Years of Humiliation, when Western powers were coming into China, taking over parts of China, Americans, we always regarded ourselves as people who were trying to protect China against European aggression and European imperialism. As, some, as many, or at least the Chinese probably know, there were in many West, in many Chinese cities, including Wuhan, there were what were called Zujia, and that was areas of the city that foreigners lived in and they did not have to obey Chinese laws. They were basically part of the, the European country they came from. And these were in, in Shanghai, uh, Qingdao, the whole number of cities, including Wuhan. There is one in Wuhan. The, and these were, were the, the, these, these Zujia were run by England, Germany, France, Russia, even Italy, had the Zujia. The United States never had a Zujia. We had people who, were, people who were living in Wuhan, but there was no special area that Americans had. They, they sort of owned it. We never did that, that assumed it, during, during this whole time. And um, <laughs> we also, the, uh, Chi the Chinese people here 
Most of you will know from your Chinese history or modern Chinese history. Uh, Ying He Tan Yun Dong, which is a rebellion by Chinese uh, people who didn't like the Westerners to be there against Westerners about 120 years ago. And this rebellion, we, we call it the Boxer Rebellion, was put down by foreign troops who came into China to stop these rebels. And the rebels had killed a number of Westerners in China. And after the, the rebels were defeated, the Chinese government, which was very poor, had to give money to the Western governments to compensate them for their people, their citizens would be killed by these rebels. So, and the U.S. was one of the countries that got money because we had some people killed in China. However, all the other countries just took the money. The U.S. at that time was the only country in the world that took the money, but then we gave it back to China. We sent it back to China, and that money was used to establish Tsinghua University. I don't know. Okay, that, that was how Kiwa University started. It was from money that was sent to the U.S. and instead of keeping it for ourselves, we gave it back to China to set up a university. So that very much tells how Americans historically, and during the period where China was very weak, that we sort of, we sort of thought we were trying as best as we could to protect China against these very powerful foreign countries or Western countries. And so it then had some, during that period, there was a lot of friction between the US and China. Then what happened that led to a, another period of hostility was the Chinese Civil War. So the Chinese Civil War between the Kuomintang and, and, and the Communist Party, Kuomintang, what, although, uh, I, don't, I don't make the story too complicated, Basically, the U.S. government during the Civil War gave support to the Kuomintang against the Kuomintang, against, against the Communist Party. And there are a number of reasons for it. One very important reason was that um, the wife of, of, the, of the head of the Kuomintang, uh, uh, Song Mei Ling, she was a Chinese woman, came from a very prominent family. Was a very, and she was married to Zhang Jisho, the head of Obinan. She was a very religious Christian, and she was extremely popular in the United States. She was the first foreign person ever invited to speak to the U.S. Congress. So she spoke, gave a speech to the U.S. Congress as the first foreigner. So she encouraged the American government, and her political allies in the U.S. were supporting Obinan, and that's her was an important part of America's support. However, even during that time, this was very controversial inside the US. There were a lot of people who thought, it's a bad idea, we should not be doing this. This is not good, but it happened. And then in 1949, the Communist Party took over China. And then there was a period of almost 25 years where there were no relations between the US and China at all. The US had no embassy in China, China had no embassy in the U.S. We had no relationships at all. Again, while this was happening, it was quite controversial politically inside the U.S. There were many people who thought that was a, a very bad idea, that we shouldn't be so isolated from China. And like, I remember when I was in high school, a long time, very long, 50 years ago, we have in the U.S. something called debate teams where Groups of students, and there's some topic they're talking about, and they debate each other. Like one, one side says one opinion, the other side says the other. Very, very common in the U.S. And one of the years I was in high school, the national debate topic, that means the topic that every student who did debate in school was debating about was, should the United States recognize communist China? So it was a very, very big and controversial question then. And what happened after all this was in 1973, President Nixon changed this policy, visited Mao Zedong in China, and a new era of Chinese-American relations was reestablished. And that's sort of work here.
that sort of began a period where the United States, where China and the United States moved from being adversaries to being friends. That was a period that began about the mid 70s. And I'm going to show you two photographs that illustrate this new period of friendship between the US and China. So this first photograph, and I don't know if the Chinese will all recognize who this person is, but it's not a Chinese woman. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this, no, no, this is President Deng Xiaoping. And this is the first time he visited the US, the first visit by a Chinese president to the US. And during that visit, he's wearing an American cowboy hat. So this is a famous picture of Deng Xiaoping being welcomed in the US. A few years later, the, uh, the, the president, John Zemin, also came to the US, and he also had a hat. <laughs> this is a little bit of a different hat. This was a hat used during the American War for Independence by the soldiers fighting for American independence. So he wore that hat. So this is the 